You know, I've been around for a while. Met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories, science, and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Does the human mind possess powers beyond our comprehension? A housewife's psychic vision helps crack a major murder case. I never wanted to be so wrong in my life. Can crimes be solved with psychic power? A Californian man remembers every moment from every day of his life. I can remember something so clearly, and then I go, wow, that was 41 years ago. Is total recall possible? And a faith healer cures terminal disease with prayer. Is it a miracle or an amazing display of mind over matter? If this was just placebo effect, you would find a handful of stories. You don't, you have thousands. Yeah. It's a weird world. And I love it. complex advance and many would say beautiful thing in nature but how much do we know about it well here are some facts for you did you know that it can process over 70,000 thoughts a day this is actually a cow brain so it's more like seven thoughts or that it has over 10,000 miles of blood vessels could you put it back please I need that or that it doesn't feel pain. Ouch, that hurts. But these amazing abilities are really only the tip of the iceberg. The big question is, what don't we know about this incredible stuff? What else can it do? Oh, this is so great. Your brain generates between 10 and 23 watts of power, enough energy to power a light bulb. Impressive, huh? This is pathetic. Weird or what? 1980, Los Angeles, California. A massive police search grips the small suburban community of local housewife Etta Smith. I think we were a little edgy because having things like that happen wasn't the everyday practice. A hospital nurse is missing and feared dead. Astoundingly, Etta was about to find herself at the center of the investigation in the most bizarre way. I made it a point to listen to the news during the day about this nurse missing. And the news said they were making a house-to-house -house search. At the moment that they said house-to-house -house search, everything went haywire. It was like I was seeing a movie. I began to see this area. I saw a trail, I saw a dirt path. I saw something white through the bushes, and I, I knew where it was. For the first time in her life, Etta's had a psychic vision. She's convinced she knows where the nurse is. She's terrified and confused. I, I didn't know what to think of it. There's some things that you just can't explain away. I'm arguing with myself. Should I go tell the police? They're gonna think I'm crazy. But what if she's there and she needs help? Etta decides to drive to where she believes the nurse to be, a nearby canyon. Just being there seems to increase her newfound psychic abilities. I see a big spray of dirt and tire marks. And I laid my hands into the tire prints. 
And as soon as I did, I could feel trauma. I mean, bad. By then, my heart is just fluttering, and I'm thinking, all I want to do is get out of here. Fighting her fear, Etta follows her instinct. Down the embankment, out the dirt path, I see something. There was white nurse's shoes. And I said, oh my God, it's her. I never wanted to be so wrong in my life. All I could think of is run, get out of here, get to the police. When the police arrive, Edda's in for a huge shock. Instead of thanking her, they're convinced she must have had something to do with the murder. To her horror, she's arrested. It was shocking. I cried till I couldn't cry anymore. Strip search me, put me in a cell by myself. It was a nightmare. After four days behind bars, Etta is finally released. Soon after, the killers, three local men, are arrested and convicted of rape and murder. Etta sues the police for false arrest, and after six years of legal battles, she wins. But even now, Etta struggles to make sense of the whole thing. I don't know if it was her spirit that came and touched me to allow me to have the vision that I had. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's one of those mysteries. What did Etta Smith experience that day? Did she have a genuine psychic vision? Remarkably, Many psychic detectives claim to solve crimes by means of mysterious insights. Is this possible? I'd say there are two kinds of psychics. Those who have no psychic ability, but believe they do, and we call them fantasizers. The other type also has no psychic ability. They know they don't, and we call them charlatans. Joe Nickel researches paranormal claims he believes there's no such thing as psychic vision or extrasensory perception. The history of ESP has been a history of self-deception, deception, wishful thinking, playing games with statistics, and not one person has been able to do anything meaningful. But if psychic ability doesn't exist, how do psychic detectives achieve such amazing results? The typical psychic engages in something we call retrofitting, or after-the-fact matching. You throw out some so-called clues. I'm getting water. I see a tall structure. And then the next thing you know, search party found the remains, and in comes the psychic saying, you know, I mentioned water, and that body was found near a creek, or a pond, or Riverside Drive, or a water tower. Remember the tall structure I mentioned? And they get by with this. The number seven was seven miles out of town, or the sheriff's license plate has two sevens in the number, or it, it's silly stuff. It doesn't help the police find the body, but it, it helps them uh, later rationalize that somehow people have visions uh, of a mystical nature. Did Edda Smith just make a lucky guess? It's not so simple that everyone who uh, claims to be a psychic is, is a simple fraud. Some, some of course, are. But some are simply self-deceived. They're what would generally be called a fantasy-prone personality. And they believe that what they imagine seems very real to them, and yet uh, they have no special powers. The average psychic detective is no use to police. In my opinion, they provide no real evidence. They create false hope. And they have done it at the expense of promoting ignorance and superstition in our society and driven unsuspecting people into the, into the clutches of fortune tellers and other people who are engaging in magical thinking rather than rational thinking. What we need to do in our society is use the organ above the neck that's able to analyze evidence and make rational judgments, not to have feelings and intuitions and so forth that don't pan out. 
I see a long life full of riches and a man named Stephen. Does that ring a bell? You know, many of us have been to palm readers, fortune tellers, people who claim to have amazing psychic abilities who are really nothing but fakes. But Eva Smith wasn't someone performing cheap tricks. She saw something in her mind even the police couldn't understand. Would she do it just for fame and fortune? Or is she truly psychic? No, Stephen? What about Harry? Are psychics real? How did Etta Smith help solve a murder? Etta definitely had a psychic vision. She had a clairvoyant vision. A Los Angeles woman has a strange and sudden vision which helps police solve a murder. Was it a genuine psychic phenomenon? Popular psychic Tana Hoy thinks so. When I first read out a story, my reaction that I had was, wow, this woman had a spontaneous psychic memory. I believe that the spirit was drawing her, pulling her to go and find her body. If anyone can testify to how important psychic visions can be to the police, it's Hoy. He's helped investigators solve a double homicide and, while on live radio, predicted a terrorist attack 90 minutes before the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. A person can hear a word, a phrase, and it will awaken a psychic memory or a psychic vision within that person. She awakened this vision, and she saw the canyon where the body was. That's an example of clairvoyant experience, clear seeing. And when she placed her hand in the tire tracks, she was making a direct connection with the energy imprint of the vehicle. Etta definitely had a psychic vision. She had a clairvoyant vision. Clairvoyance comes from the French word, and it means clear seeing. And she had visions inside her head that she could clearly see. So that would be definitely considered a psychic experience. I also would like to say everybody is psychic. We just, some people have learned to develop it and tap into it, and others haven't. Uh, men, businessmen often talk about having hunches. Very common, talk to a businessman, a stockbroker, some kind of investor, he'll say, oh, I just had a hunch. Or a businessman will say, well, I didn't hire that person, I just had a gut feeling it wasn't right. Women talk about their intuition. I just had an intuitive feeling that this was gonna be like this, or I had a sense that person wasn't telling me the truth. Have you ever felt someone was lying, or had a sense about something, or felt somebody wasn't a good person, or you could trust that person, or you couldn't trust that person? You've had a psychic experience. We just don't call them psychic feelings, but anything that you're able to know, sense, or feel outside of your normal five senses is psychic in nature. But if Etta's vision was for real, why didn't the police believe her? We're going back to 1980. So back then, we didn't have the awareness of psychics that we have today. Today we see TV shows and we see psychics on talk shows. I don't feel that she would have been arrested today. So given their remarkable successes, should detectives add psychics to the force? A lot of psychics, when they work with police departments, they don't do it for publicity. They do it to help and give back. So it happens a lot more than we ever hear about. But did Etta Smith really see something with her mind? Psychology professor Tim Moore thinks not. I think Etta may have overheard information in the community without fully processing it at the time that she acquired it. But later on, it registered and prompted her to go to the police. Moore believes something in Etta's unconscious memory triggered what she thought was a psychic vision. Psychologists call it source misattribution. Source misattribution, you have information to which you falsely attribute having acquired as a result of experience when in fact it's been suggested to you or provided to you by someone else. Etta Smith wasn't the killer, so how could she have any idea where the body was? My understanding is that 
the actual culprits were blabbermouths. And they talked about what they had done in their neighborhood, which was her neighborhood. Could Etta's psychic vision be mistaken for random information she had nothing to do with? If Etta's not concentrating on the information at the time that she's hearing it, because that's not the focus of her attention, the information nevertheless gets in, but she doesn't remember the source. At some later date, she hears information on the news that the police are looking for a missing body. She recollects somewhat hazily or without appreciating how she came by that information. But how could Ed have known the exact location of the body, the precise road in the right canyon? I believe she's familiar with the area, so the original information could easily have triggered a cognitive map. The canyon roads there, for example, are pretty distinctive. She may have intuited, just on the basis of what she overheard, where the body probably was. I mean, that's not a stretch. Did the unexpected recall of a hidden memory lead Etta to the body? Or did she experience a genuine psychic event which helped solve a case the police could not, whatever the truth? This story is most definitely weird. Or what? You know, the human brain has been evolving for, uh, 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 uh hold it. Uh, what, how long has it been evolving? 2.5 million years. 903B, take two, marker. Action. You know, the human brain has been evolving for two and a half million years, but perhaps one of the greatest things that sets us apart from any other creature is the power. Uh, oh, damn. 903B, take three, marker. And action. You know, the human brain has been evolving for two and a half million years, but perhaps one of the greatest things that sets us apart from any other creature is the power of our memory. Yay. Oh, come on. Where are my keys? Damn. Oh, wow. They say that everyone has a special talent. And in Bob Petrella's case, that's certainly true. But he possesses something so special, it sets him apart from the rest of humankind. The reaction kind of varies. A lot of people are amazed. A lot of people call it a phenomenon, a strange and unusual. Even old friends are still shocked when they see Bob's power on display. Oh, very good, very good. May 18th, 1980. Oh, that's Mount St. Helens. Nerve gas attack in Tokyo subway. March 20th, 95. Correct. Yeah. Princess Diana's wedding. July 29th, 81, it was a Wednesday. It may seem that Bob just has a gift for remembering trivia, but there's much more to his incredible talent. He can remember nearly every single moment from every single day of his life. I threw a bowl of soup on the ceiling <laughs> on March 13th, 75. I got sometimes when they think you're lying, they think you're making it up. But every fact Bob pulls from his mind is correct. His memory is somehow perfect. When's my birthday? November 8th. What's the year? 68. What day of the week was it? Friday. What were you doing that day? I was at a football game watching Beaver Falls play Hopewell. Beaver Falls got beat, I think, 28 to 7. Bob is the best friend to have. <laughs> he always remembers your birthday. He remembers your anniversary. You also remember stuff that we did that I completely forgot. We've been working for a long time, and he'll call me up. and I, Ten years ago, Nancy, we were on a plane to New York to do this story. And I'm like, ten years ago? Um, yeah, we were, weren't we? Well, usually anniversaries, uh, I'll do it for that if it's, uh, you know, oh, by the way, uh, November 8th, November 2nd, July 11th. Oh, <laughs> very good, very good. So it is cool having a friend, but it's not something that's always in your face, you know? I mean, you're very stealth about your well, ability. Well, that's not my experience, because I watch football with him. So every time we watch a game, <laughs> He'll say, remember that game three years ago when someone said this? And I'm just like, I don't remember yesterday. Like, what are you talking about? I, his, the, the ability to remember detail from games and things that happened in games. And I just realized, and, and, and you know, because I, 
I just think of you as a buddy, I think, God, my memory's terrible. I don't remember that at all. I don't, how come I don't remember that? And it's... Unbelievable though it seems, Bob remembers every detail of every experience he's ever had. It's a little unnerving. Sometimes I even amaze myself and I remember mundane things about when I got a haircut or what I had for lunch on a certain day. A lot of people are like, they look at you and just totally amazed. But how is this possible? We all know our memory is far from complete. Words and names stick on the tips of our tongues, to say nothing of the inconsequential details of daily life. May 1st, let's go back May 1st, 10 years. What was I? Well, May 1st, 91, I was wrapping up a job at Pacific State University. That was a Tuesday, and that was the NFL draft. Yeah, yeah. that's usually going to yeah. be around draft yeah. day. Yeah. And then May 1st, 81, I was uh, house-sitting in Laurel Canyon for this woman named Autumn Brown. May 1st, 71 was a Saturday. Oh, and I was back east visiting. I went out drinking for the first time as a 21-year-old in a bar. It was a Saturday, you know, and, they, and I was, uh, let's see your idea. Yeah, here it is, pal, I'm 21, you know. So it was like only three days after my 21st birthday. Incredibly, Bob is not the only person with a perfect memory. He is part of an exclusive club around 20 people worldwide have what scientists now call super autobiographical memory, the ability to remember every single day of their lives. Yeah, the amazing part of, uh, to me sometimes is I can remember something so clearly and then I go, wow, that was 41 years ago. I'm not sure how it works. It came natural to me. A man with a super memory that can remember the tiniest detail from every part of his life. Now, that's impressive. But he's not the only one. You see, I've got some tricks of the trade myself. For instance, I've forgotten where I put my phone and to stimulate my memory, I use another phone to uh, call it. And then I listen. <laughs> and then I simply head towards the source of the sound. And I should find it in the last place I was doing something important. Okay, I know it's in here now. Oh, come on. Yeah, no. Ah! You see? It works every time. Hello? The ice cream is in the refrigerator. So what explains Bob Petrella's incredible gift? Could the rest of us have this superpower? We all have this capacity. A Californian man has an incredible gift. He is able to remember every detail of every day of his life. Does he possess a kind of superpower? When I first heard about um, this idea that it did smell right to me. Gary Marcus is a cognitive scientist. He believes people with super memory might not be so super after all. I think what's really happening in this syndrome is that people are really spending a lot of time studying their own lives. People might try to remember the past because they want to hold on to it. It's not necessarily voluntary. Most of us, if we're interested in something, don't obsess over it. I think one thing that often happens in this syndrome is people are particularly interested in the details of their own lives. Not everybody is, so I think my life is interesting, but not so interesting that I spend a lot of time thinking about what happened to me in the past. I'm usually focused on what's gonna happen next rather than what happened in the past. But some people are particularly interested, just like people might be interested in genealogy, or some people are interested in sports facts because they like sports. When I was a kid, I paid a lot of attention to baseball statistics because that's what I liked. Everybody has different things that they like, and some of us spend more time than others trying to actually remember those things. So is super memory just a form of obsession? To find out, Marcus spent time with other people who also claim they have it. I think that people who have studied this phenomena have focused on what the people who have the phenomena are good at. But with the person that I tested that had this kind of syndrome, I kind of focused on some things that I thought they might be bad at and indeed were. When given standard memory tests like recalling lists of words, Marcus found people with so-called super memory did no better than anyone else. I think we as a species are worried that we're being replaced by machines. They're probably worried with good reason because machines do have better memory. So when you find a person that at least looks a little bit like they have memory as good as a machine, maybe it makes us feel better about ourselves. I mean, the reality is in the long term, no human's ever going to match the memory of a machine. The idea of photographic memory is a myth and there's no human being that really has the level of control over their memory that a computer does.
people with superior autobiographical memory can get really good at memorizing the details of their own lives, but it doesn't extend to everything. If they're not interested in it, they're not going to remember it. So has Bob simply chosen to obsessively memorize his entire life? Not everyone is convinced. Dr. James McGaw was the first psychologist to study super memory. The most surprising thing about this ability to me is what it surprises everybody. The fact that it can be done at all. If I should ask anybody what they did yesterday, then most people could run through the day yesterday pretty easily. And even the day before, if they think about it, they could run through. And that is not unlike what these people are able to do, except they can do it for every day of their life. So the question is, why is it that these su subjects can do it for all days, and the rest of it can only do for one or two days with any reliability, aside from remembering special days and special events, because we all remember birthdays and weddings and funerals and uh, ac automobile accidents and things of, of that kind. After interviewing more than a dozen people with super memory, he's convinced they're not merely obsessive. One of our subjects made this very clear when somebody suggested that all that she does is sit around and re-rehearse all of her information. And she said, let me get this straight. I have a full-time job and I have a life and I'm supposed to be sitting around re-rehearsing all of those experiences. Highly unlikely. McGaw feels that people like Bob are a real phenomena with memories way, way beyond that of even the best minds. An average person can learn to do some memory tricks. There are individuals who have memorized the number pi out to 30,000 places. But that type of ability is restricted to that kind of information. People with superior autobiographical memory capture their daily experiences and it doesn't really make much difference what kind of information it is, they just hold it. But if it's not an obsession, how else would they remember their lives in such detail? McGaw is working on an incredible theory. One possibility is that we all store all this information about all of our experiences in our brain someplace. We all have this capacity, and they are able to tap this capacity in ways that we can't. But how come people like Bob are able to do this and the rest of us can't? We're beginning to find that there are some regions of the brains of our subjects who have this strong memory that are larger than the same regions in control subjects of the same age and sex. It's believed part of the brain, called the caudate nuclei, is seven times larger in people with super memory. Could this somehow explain Bob's gift? If the human brain is capable of doing that, that tells us that the human brain has this amazing capacity. There's something really important here, something unique and something important. Do super memorizers have turbocharged brains, or is there another answer to this mystery of the mind? And I say, okay, and I, I see the year, and I see the month, and then I, and then I accuse him. A man has an amazing ability. He can remember almost every moment from every day of his life. But how? Dr. Mary Spiller is a psychologist at the University of East London. She believes super memory could be explained by a medical condition called synesthesia. Synesthesia is probably best thought of as a crossing of the senses. So someone with synesthesia, when they hear music, they may see colours, or when they hear words, they might have tastes. So for example, the word tomorrow might taste like bacon, the word computer might taste like ice cream, um, the letter F might be a bright pink colour, number five could be um, a blue colour. Um, and we think that it's probably a hereditary condition, so people with synesthesia um, typically might have other f members of the family might also have synesthesia, their um, father, their grandmother might have it. Um, and research is currently looking to see what genes are associated with synesthesia. It's an amazing concept, but how could it result in super memory? Dr. Spiller believes people like Bob may have a rare form of the condition called time-space synesthesia. 
People with time-space synesthesia see time. For example, someone may think of um, the months of the year as being located in a circle around their body. So January could be here, and then February, um, March, April, May, and so on around their body. And this can work for years as well. Could the ability to see time allow people to keep their memories perfectly organized? If you ask the synesthete, where is this particular Monday in 1978, they always know where in space that uh, moment in time is. Almost as if they're looking it up in a filing cabinet. This gives people with time-space synesthesia an advantage when it comes to remembering when things happened. Sure enough, when people with super memory are asked to remember an event, they speak like they're seeing it. And I see where May 1st is. I, I see the year, and I see the month. And then I, and then I, then it cues into the day. And I say, okay, Could this be proof that year, Bob and, and others with super memory have some form of time, space, synesthesia? I think it's definitely possible that other individuals with highly superior autobiographical memory could have time, space, synesthesia. Having a 3D sense of time could potentially have huge benefits for someone when storing memories. Does the ability to see time explain Bob's near total recall? Or is it because he has a slightly different brain than the rest of us? Or are people with super memory such fans of their own lives they can't stand to forget a minute of it? Weird or what? I gave him a choice. You know, it was my birthday the other day. As you can see, I got some Really great presence. The problem is with this newfangled packet. It's a miracle you can get them. Hang on. Ah. This should do the job. Ah. Yeah. At least I got it open. But do miracles, even small ones, have a rational explanation? Or are they gifts from a divine and superior power? Or are they something else? In 1993, Julie Spahn was living a happy life with her children and husband, Greg. But one August night, her life was suddenly ripped apart. We were having a dinner, and suddenly Julie sat down, and I heard a cracking sound like a broken baseball bat, and saw her head fall to the table. In a horrible freak accident, Julie had smashed her head on a shelf behind her seat. And that's the last time I saw my wife for many years, as far as the Julie I knew. I fractured the um, temporal bone in the back of my head. And which led to a significant brain bleed. It's a very serious injury. In that moment, Julie's world turned upside down. For the next 13 years, to put it bluntly, my life was pure hell. I um, literally had headaches every single day. I had uh, visual problems. I couldn't walk. I couldn't sleep. Julie visited some of the best doctors and specialists in the world, but they were unanimous. Julie's brain injury would leave her in excruciating pain for the rest of her life. I lived at my lowest point. Part of me was terrified for my life. But then one afternoon, in 2008, Julie sees a TV show featuring a controversial faith healer. Immediately, she knows something phenomenal is happening. It was just incredible. I just had a really distinct peace come about me. And I thought, I really want to go see this man. The faith healer is Ohio-based anesthesiologist, Dr. Isim Nema. He claims to heal terminal illnesses through prayer. Two months after seeing him on TV, Julie decides to meet him. And when Dr. Namie walked in, 
I started feeling a great deal of warmth in my lower back. And <laughs> I'm automatically thinking, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> what can be happening already? Could the power of Dr. Nema's prayer really be having an effect on Julie? The life came back into her eyes that had been gone for all these years. And uh, I just saw a total transformation in all aspects of muscle tone and color and warmth and uh, just life. Uh, it was really amazing. Incredibly, Julie's pain is gone. The headaches disappear. Her vision comes back. She can move normally again. And I said, I don't think I need this cane anymore. And I proceeded to walk right out to the car and get in the car all by myself, which I couldn't do before. It was obvious something major had happened. Her doctors can't explain her recovery, but Julie has no doubts. I definitely feel like I received a miracle. There is no other explanation for it. But Julie is far from alone. Thousands claim that Nema's prayers have healed me. The Lord took the pain from me, relieved me of it. I had my own personal miracle. From cancer to multiple sclerosis, it appears no disease, ailment, or condition is too powerful for Nema's healing powers. As word spreads, people travel from all over the world to attend his services. But what's happening to people like Julie? Are they really experiencing miracles at the hands of a faith healer? Or is their recovery an incredible demonstration of the power of the mind? Is it psychological? Well, of course it's psychological. An Ohio doctor claims to cure terminal diseases through prayer. Is he really a miracle worker? Gilbert Ross is the medical director of the American Council on Science and Health. Being a skeptic is part of his job. Merely because a patient uh, undergoes a, uh, a miraculous recovery after seeing a faith healer, in no way means that the faith healer had any actual active role in the, uh, in the improvement. Ross has a more rational explanation. He believes the power of healing comes from the extraordinary power of the human mind. The uh, successful faith healing is entirely the result of the placebo effect. It's purely dependent upon the patient's belief that the faith healing is, is effective. The placebo effect is a recognized medical phenomenon. People who believe they are getting treated get better. Incredibly, in some clinical trials, placebos have proven more effective than surgery. If you give the patient a jar of sugar pills and you encourage them to believe that it's a, some sort of medication that will help them, you can provoke a placebo response, which may have some actual beneficial effect. Uh, also, you'll be avoiding any potential for uh, side effects or complications from giving the patient any sort of active medication. Now, the downside of that, and there's a very strong case to be made, is that this is unethical. That uh, a doctor who gives a patient a medication, including a sugar pill as a placebo, knowing that it's inactive, and yet not telling the patient that, is, is lying to the patient. Uh, and, uh, and whatever the good intentions of that act are, it's, it's unethical on its face. Nobody knows exactly how it is that placebos can be so powerful, but it's accepted that the mind has awesome healing abilities, and that just believing in a cure is a powerful medicine. The placebo effect is real in that a certain percentage of patients will feel better just from the intervention. Is it psychological? Well, of course it's psychological if you're not administering an active ingredient. But that doesn't mean that it's not real and it, it, it doesn't mean that it's not biochemical or physiological either. The, uh, the psyche is an extremely powerful uh, force and uh, the brain does indeed manufacture neurohumoral factors that uh, come into play in, in the body's uh, metabolism. Uh, this is well known. I mean, the uh, antidepressant pills, the selective serotonin re uh, reuptake inhibitors, act on brain chemicals. So we know very well that mood and, and affect and behavior are to some extent chemical-based. So why shouldn't uh, a psychological uh, factor uh, generate uh, chemicals that also help patients to feel better? 
So can this phenomena explain Dr. Nema's success? Could faith healing be a placebo that cures only because people believe? Patients who have strong beliefs in spirituality, including religion, would be more receptive to all sorts of placebo effects, including faith healing. It has to do with some kind of ritual and the patient's sincere belief that what they're going through with the faith healer is going to help them. Can the success stories of faith healers like Dr. Nema be explained by medical mind over matter? If this was just placebo effect, if it was just temporary, you would find a handful of stories. You don't, you have hundreds, you have thousands. Christian radio host Trapper Jack Keller has no doubt that Dr. Nema is performing bona fide miracles, something he's witnessed firsthand. I have retinitis pigmentosa. I'm legally blind. It's a degenerative retinal disease. But uh, twice in the 11 years I've known Dr. Nemi, my vision's been fully restored. Both amazing, dramatic moments that certainly got my attention. I haven't been able to see in the dark since I was 13 and uh, I get up at 2.30 in the morning to do my radio show and I actually woke up before the alarm went off. And I, uh, I, I get up and I, I just suddenly realize I can see everything. I can see the dresser, I see the chair, I see the table, the lamp, the, the fan, I, I can see everything. And I'm looking, I'm looking for the light source. How can I see these things? It's pitch black, but it, you know, where's the light source? And there was no light source. It lasted about 60 seconds and then the blackness came back. But for me, a beautiful sign, beautiful sign of things to come. And it's my belief that it will come back when it most serves God. But how can someone perform these cures? Where does Dr. Nema's healing power come from? He's not doing the healing. He takes no credit for it. God does it all. But he gets to be the spectator. He gets to watch it happen. He's the connector. So how does it work? What does Dr. Nema do at his services? Something happens. And it happens over and over again thousands of times over. I've seen people with MS, I've seen people with blindness, people who have been told they're gonna die of cancer. Suddenly, literally, in the blink of an eye, the tumor's gone. For Keller, Dr. Nema's healings are part of a tradition as old as Christianity itself. The healing stories are, are written about in the Bible. You know, you take it back to Jesus' time, and then the apostles were healing. And you realize that uh, it, it, it's always been there. Absolutely, there are, there are so many stories about miraculous healings from the apostles. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. But why Dr. Nema? Why is it that he has the gift and not anyone else? I believe Dr. Nema was put on this earth to help people find their way to God. And God gave him that extra portion of faith. And that faith is being utilized beautifully. Miracles are happening to get your attention. This is an incredible story, but is it just that, a story? Do faith healers hold the power to heal the sick or the dying in the palm of their hands? Do they possess something that science cannot identify, something beyond this world? Or are they less than angels? Is Dr. Nema performing modern day miracles? Should we take faith healers seriously? Faith healers are either knowing or unconscious frauds. Thousands of seriously ill people report being cured at the hands of a faith healer. Some say it's a miracle. Others think it's all simply the power of suggestion. Faith healers are either knowing or unconscious frauds, that they use various conscious tricks to lead people to believe that they've been healed when they have not been healed. Terence Hines is a professor of psychology at Pace University, New York. He takes a rational approach to Dr. Nema's success stories. The patient's own belief that they're going to be cured, I think, certainly plays a role. Getting people excited so that they won't feel pain through perhaps endorphin release is another trick. Endorphins are the body's natural painkillers. Uh, they're released under, under situations of high stress and arousal. So the patient will, in fact, believe, getting it correctly, that they've been cured. Hines has spent time undercover investigating faith healers. 
he found that in some cases, they relied on trickery. We went undercover at a faith healing meeting held in Brooklyn, New York. And about halfway through the healing session, uh, an elderly gentleman was, was brought up on stage in a wheelchair. The faith healer uh, laid his hands on this gentleman in the wheelchair and bade him walk. And this gentleman got out of his wheelchair, walked up and down the stage to great applause. It was a miracle. But in fact, one of the other members of the team had noticed this gentleman walk into the meeting hall under his own power earlier in the performance. As he neared the stage, one of the faith healer's assistants walked up to him and said, sir, would you like a wheelchair? So this gentleman sits in the wheelchair. 45 minutes later, he finds himself brought up on stage and asked to walk. Well, he can walk. And he doesn't have the power to grab the microphone from the healer and say, well, but I walked in here by myself. Thus, a miracle is performed. At the end of the meeting, the faith healer did something that I find reprehensible. Uh, he said, even if you haven't been called up tonight, you're all cured. You go home, you throw away that medicine. You don't need your insulin anymore. You don't need that heart medicine. You've been cured by Dr. Jesus. Throw that medicine away. That's disgraceful. But why would some faith healers set out to dupe people? According to Heinz, it's a profitable game. All faith healers that I've come across don't charge admission to their to their services. It's free. Uh, but at the during the service, they certainly ask for donations. At the faith healing meeting I went to, I became a volunteer usher, and I was given a collection bucket, yay big. And I thought, they're crazy if they're going to get this thing filled with, with money. I was the crazy one. I was pushing the $50, $100 bills and $20 bills down into the bucket. I think I probably cleared about $6,000. Now, there were 12 ushers. 12 times 6 is $72,000 taken out of that community in one night. I would call it a license to steal. Because at least in the United States, since they are a religious entity, they are exempt from any and all taxes. So there's no income tax on this money. Uh, so yes, it's a license to steal. And in, at least in the United States, uh, they are probably not in fact doing anything illegal. And I'm not sure they should be, I don't, I'm not sure I could, not being a lawyer, could draft a law that would be constitutional and make it illegal. Heinz believes it's easy to hoodwink people into believing they've been cured. To prove it, he set up a demonstration of the power of suggestion. So we have an actor who will play a doctor, a healer, and one of the gimmicks that he has is a neural stimulator. The patient will be told this will reduce their pain. In fact, the neural stimulator is a classic placebo, a prop that does nothing. And what we expect to find is that a number of people, not everybody, but a number of people say, my God, my pain's really gone. I can feel that. The oh. first volunteer reports a pain in her ankle. Our fake doctor assures okay. her okay. he can help. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to turn it on. I want you to keep breathing. And when I turn it on, you're going to feel the energy coming out through your head, OK? Here we go. Do you feel the difference that this is making already? Yeah, it feels, it's relaxing. <laughs> Phenomenal, look at that. She's moving in already, right? <laughs> yeah, didn't see how it would work, but actually, like I had a pain like right at the top of my foot and now I couldn't even like bend it, but now it, it seems to be better, like I can move it. It doesn't hurt as bad anymore. Hein's theory seems to prove correct as volunteer after volunteer are easily deceived by the fake doctor. So much so, he feels it might have been a profitable day. The people who, who reported a positive change probably would have given it a donation. Uh, not a huge amount, because again, they didn't come prepared for that. But yes, I suspect a donation could have been wrung from them. So are faith healers con men who prey on the weak and vulnerable? Or can healers like Dr. Nema channel science-defying miracles into ailing bodies? Or is it simply that our own minds are so medically potent that people like Julie can heal themselves with the power of belief? Weird. Or what? So there we have it. Three stories exploring the untapped power of the human mind. A woman's paranormal vision helps solve a murder. 
Can horrific crimes be solved by psychic powers? A Californian man can remember nearly every moment from every day of his life. Can we all one day have total recall? And a faith here cures terminal illnesses through prayer. Is it a modern day miracle or an awesome demonstration of mind over matter? You decide. Join me again next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?